just a small announcement. Uh, the workshops have started in Hall E. So whoever would like to proceed there can go there. And uh, I would like to invite the chairperson for the next session, Dr. Mandar Agashe and Dr. Binoti Shet for the session on all about pediatric fracture neck femur. So we are on for the next session, which is going to be a very exciting session about a very difficult topic in pediatric orthopedics, which is pediatric femoral neck fractures. And we have with us our two conveners, Dr. Alri Karujis and Dr. Sandeep Vaidya. So over to Dr. Sandeep for starting the session. Yeah, so welcome everybody and uh, uh, thanks for attending this session. Myself and Dr. Alri Karujis, my co-convener, uh, invite you here. And uh, we have a great star student faculty with us. I invite Dr. Sandeep Patwardhan from Pune, Dr. Viraj Shingade from Nagpur. I thank them from, for having traveled all the way over here for attending this uh, YROC. And our own Bombay boys, uh, Dr. Avisha and Dr. Chintan Doshi. So without uh, much ado, I will now invite uh, Dr. Avisha to come over and uh, start his talk on anatomy, blood supply and classification of pediatric fracture neck femur. Avi. Thank you so much, uh, Sandeep sir, and thank you so much, uh, Vairav. So I'm going to be talking on the anatomy, blood supply and the classification. Um, I'm glad to be here because a lot of my mentors are here and a lot of the people I have learned a lot of are already in this room. So I'm going to be talking about the relevant anatomy, really understanding the blood supply, what are the current understanding and concepts and the classifications. So we know the proximal femur is developing. Initially, there is a common uh, cartilage at birth and which later divides into the epiphysis and the trochanteric epiphysis by age four. So the common uh, separation occurs by age four. And in the femoral head, the ossification center in females appears by four to seven months and in males by five to eight months. And the greater trochanter by four years and the lesser trochanter by 12 to 14 years. So we know the, uh, it, during the development, the growth is around four millimeters a year. The closure happens at around age 15 to uh, 18. And the greater trochanter we know closes earlier as compared. So we know the hip joint uh, requires the head to be inside the acetabulum for its development because of the divergent vectors of the proximal growth plates and dynamic oppositional forces with the acetabulum to help mature its shape. The anatomy itself changes with age, the neck shaft angle, the antiversion and the offset. The iliopsoas, abductors, external rotators, the gluteus maximus and the adductors, they are attached uh, to the distal fragment. So we know it leads to proximal and medial translation and external rotation distally. The proximal fragment, whenever there is a fracture, there is no muscle attachments. So usually it is pushed passively by the trochanteric fragment uh, with the fracture surface usually appearing anterior superior laterally. So the vascular anatomy that we've all been taught uh, since our MBBS days is the main, is the profunda femoris artery, which gives the uh, medial circumflex and the lateral circumflex, where the medial circumflex being the main branch. Then we have the uh, artery of the ligamentum teres, which comes from the obturator artery, then branches from the superior gluteal and the inferior gluteal artery. And all of these form a uh, circumflex around the proximal femoral joint. So the vascular anatomy that we have taught, so we know the MCFA is the main branch. MCFA gives uh, branches which uh, pierce the capsule and enter into the femoral neck. Here it gives the retinacular vessels. These retinacular vessels, the most important of it is the posterior superior, then the anterior ascending, and then we have the posterior inferior. The posterior superior is the main branch. These ascending branches at times form a subsynovial ring and then gives the epiphyseal branches. There are sometimes anastomosis with the superior luteal and the inferior luteal arteries. This is what we have been taught, but this is now considered often inaccurate, imprecise and wrong at times. 
So the vascular anatomy uh, also changes with age as per the blood supply. Uh, when children less than four years, the main blood supply comes from the lateral epiphyseal and the metaphyseal arteries. By four to eight years, it's the, just the lateral epiphyseal arteries. And more than eight years, it's the artery from the ligamentum teres and lateral epiphyseal. And in adolescence, it's almost like a mature adult. So this is what we know. But now, uh, in the last past two decades, there have been a lot of anatomical studies which have shown to the contrary. So the current concepts is we know the main vessel is the deep branch of the medial circumference artery. It has an, uh, sometimes has an anastomosis with the inferior gluteal artery and the pyriformis branch of the inferior gluteal artery sometimes can also be the main branch in 10% of the population. So the deep branch of the medial circumflex artery is a vessel which goes from anterior to posterior. Posteriorly, uh, it goes between the iliopsoas and pectineus. Then the obturator externus, it goes inferiorly to it, crosses over it and then goes underneath the surface of the triceps coxae that is your superior gamilae and your pyriformis to reach your pyriformis fossa to enter the capsule and then give its epiphyseal vessels. So these epiphyseal vessels are very important. These deep branch give nutrient vessels, vessels even to the trochanteric branch and the terminal subsynovial branches which are the main important blood supply. Lot of studies have shown that these superior retinacular vessels give 84% of the blood supply to your head. 16% of it can be mixed and most of the time the posterior neck is free from any of these vessels. So the point to remember is the ligamentum teres artery is really not important, very occasionally gives some blood supply to near its attachment. The deep branch of the lateral, uh, of the lateral circulum artery mainly just supplies the neck. The MCFA is really important. So we have multiple classifications. The uh, Delbe classification given by Colonna is the most uh, commonly used and it was modified uh, by Jew et al. in 2016 to add in type 1 uh, if there is a dislocation associated with or not. We know that in this classification the frequency uh, increases from types 1 to 5 and inversely as to risk of avian from type 1 to 5. The Powell's classification is also really important. And the AO is the new classification, which is a quite broad classification, which covers multiple different types of uh, fractures. Uh, this was a paper in uh, 2015, which uh, gave a classification for helping us to uh, use the implant, where they divided the neck in zones of 25%. And in zone 1 and 2, they said it would be better to use smooth pins and the other zones, screws and uh, plates. So in summary, we know these fractures, even though they have a low incidence but they have a high complication rate. It is important to understand not just the anatomy but the blood supply to prevent complications, guide safe surgical approaches and to plan the management and guide the prognosis. Thank you so much. Thanks Avi. That was a very succinct description of the anatomy and the blood supply of the proximal femur. Our next speaker is Dr. Sandeep Vaidya who is going to talk to us about the management of acute fracture neck femur. Yeah, thanks Avi. So, my brief is to talk about uh, acute management of fracture neck femur in children. And uh, this is a brief outline of the points which I am going to touch upon. So, firstly regarding the timing, uh, the aims of uh, treatment of a fracture neck femur are to achieve union in good alignment with minimal avian rates. And what are the surgeon uh, factors that uh, the surgeon can control in order to achieve these uh, objectives are to do timely surgery, obtain an anatomical reduction with adequate stabilization. Regarding the timing of surgery, now there is a good body of scientific evidence which shows that delay in surgery up to 24 hours does not have an adverse impact of outcomes in, comes, in terms of avian and non-union. Therefore, the recommendation is that these fractures should not be operated in the middle of the night. Rather, they should be operated in the next day routine OR because these are uh, challenging procedures and they should be done when you and your team are fresh and all the implants and necessary instrumentation are readily available. The close reduction should be performed on the fracture table and the classical lead better maneuver is performed. This consists of initial traction, flexion and external rotation followed by internal rotation and extension. After close reduction, it has been proposed that capsulotomy helps to decrease the rates of avian in femur neck fractures. By draining the tense intraarticular hematoma, you are relieving the tamponade effect on the retinacular vessels which improves the perfusion of the uh, femoral head. 
This capsulotomy can be performed by minimally invasive approach by advancing in blade, uh, a blade flush along the anterior surface of the femoral neck. What is an acceptable reduction? So it is known that the quality of reduction determines the uh, chances of complications including non-union and avian. Therefore, it is mandatory that in all fracture neck femurs, you should aim for an anatomical reduction. The reduction can be assessed by seeing the contours of the S and reverse S along the borders of the femoral neck on both AP and lateral views. Any breakage in these contours indicates unsatisfactory reduction and in case of unsatisfactory reduction, one should not hesitate to go ahead with open reduction. Coming to open reduction, so which is the uh, ideal approach? So that depends on the del bay type. So in these more medial fractures, that is type 1 and type 2 del bay, the anterior Smith-Peterson approach between the sartorius and TFL gives a direct access to the fracture site. In the more lateral fractures, that is type 3 and type 4 fractures, the anterolateral Watson-Jones approach between the TFL and gluteus medius may be employed. Regarding the fixation, there can be various uh, dilemmas. What should be the choice of implant? Should you cross the physis? Should you apply the hip spica cast? And the two main determinants over here are the age of the child and the del bay type. So for example, this is a young child around 3 years old with a del bay type 1 fracture. Here obviously preservation of facial growth is an important consideration and therefore here fixation across the physis is done with a smooth K-wire. Since the K-wire does not offer uh, adequate stabilization and additional hip spica is supplemented. Also the wire is removed soon after union in order to decrease your chances of growth arrest. On the other hand, in an older child, stable fixation is absolutely mandatory. If stability can be adequately achieved by stopping your implant short of the physis, it's well and good. However, if there is any doubt regarding the stability of your fixation, don't hesitate to cross the physis. Remember that in these scenarios, stability of the physis gets precedence over preserving the physis. In more lateral fractures, that is the del bay type 4 or the BC cervical intertrochanteric fractures, you may need to use an implant with a side plate in order to give adequate stability. So to conclude, fractured neck femurs in children are fractures of necessity. Don't underestimate them. They should be operated within 24 hours. Anatomical reduction is mandatory. Try to achieve anatomical reduction if close reduction with, but if that is not possible, then go ahead with open reduction. And stable fixation is necessary. If in order to achieve a stable fixation, you need to cross the physis, it is perfectly fine. Thank you. Thank you, Sandeep. That was really very nice and very precise. I invite the next speaker, Dr. Allery Karujas, who will be talking to us about complications of pediatric neck femur fracture. Thank you, Binoti. As uh, Sandeep has rightly pointed out, fractured neck femur and children are known more for their complications rather than for the actual problem that they are. So today I'm going to focus on some of the complications of fractured neck femur in children. We are hoping to save some time for the case discussions. So I'll just cover two important complications, which is uh, avascular necrosis and non-union. So, Alric, yeah. So probably we can have a couple of questions till then, till the time the presentation is loaded. Sure. Any questions from uh, the audience? You can step up to the mics. There are six mics that I can see in front here. Yeah, I think it's on, sir. Uh, yes, micro number three. You said uh, they, we need stable fixation and we don't hesitate crossing the physis. My question is, what happens in those cases where you cross the physis? Any other extra surgery required, there was a growth arrest and further follow-up. Good question. My Sandeep, question. you want to take that? Yeah, so I think Alric, uh, we will cover this point uh, in the future talks and the case discussion as well. But the point is that the proximal femur is not the growing end of the bone. It contributes only about 15 to 20 percent. And by the age of the older age group, that is beyond the age of 8 to 10, almost most of the growth arising from the proximal physis is almost over. That's why in this age group where the fracture neck femur is more common, even if you land up with a growth arrest, it is perfectly okay. However, if you land up with a non-union or avian, then it is potentially, uh, you know, uh, risking the uh, salvageability of the hip for a lifetime. Yeah, I think the answer to that, or as Sandeep rightly pointed out, is are you using smooth pins or are you using ca cancellous screws? If you're using smooth pins, uh, I don't think it causes much of a problem to the proximal femoral physis. If you're using screws, 
remember that we are using them generally in the older age group after the age of 10. So again, the growth in the proximal femur at that age is not much at all. Dr. Mukhi. Yeah, is, uh, when you cross the physis, is it mandatory to remove the implant earlier? Sandeep. Mandatory. If, you, if you're performing beyond the age of say 8 to 10, I don't think there is any need to do so. So uh, I would agree with that, Dr. Mukhi, that if you do it in a very young child, which I've done occasionally, as soon as you know that you've got fracture union within six to eight months, it's a good idea to take off the implant. Sir, Sandeep, uh, what happens, uh, screws are uh, passed behind the physis to the head later. What is the uh, uh, future of this head? Yeah, there is a chance that a physis will, uh, you know, uh, stop growing earlier. But what I'm saying is the implications of this growth arrest in an older child, more than 10 years uh, age, it does not lead to any, you know, adverse impacts in terms of either deformity or uh, limb length discrepancy because the proximal femur is not the growing end of the bone. The main growing end of the bone is the distal femur. Whether the deformity occurs in the head? No, which, uh, I don't think there are any, there is any evidence to support that. You have, agree, Elric? Yes. So I think you sometimes can get a little smaller head. Sometimes you can have a problem with the neck growth as well. And we've seen that when it happens in younger children. But as we already said, you know, the growth of the proximal fever is really not much. And it's better to have a slight growth arrest, to have a, a little bit of a coxavara rather than to have a non-union. So you have to balance out, you know, what you want, really what is easier to deal with and what is more difficult to deal with. I think if you're having a problem with the presentation, let's go ahead with the cases so that I think the case itself will bring out most of these points. Yes, any other uh, question, Dr. Mukhi? While doing the DHS, if you have broken the wire, guide wire, how much struggle you can do <laughs> in a child? Sure. So I think we'll come to that, the case discussions as well. When do we use the DHS? And as uh, I think uh, who has, I think Sandeep showed, that it's really good when you're having more of a basic cervical or endotrochantric fracture. It's not a good implant maybe for a trans cervical fracture like a delbit 2. Uh, there's also a chance of torsion as you put the uh, DHS screw in. So you have to have an anti-torsion wire or to have another screw in place. So it's not a really great implant. It's shown in evidence also that for a delbit type 2 and even sometimes a type 3, cancellous screws might be a better option than a side plate. Let's move on to the case discussions. Having a problem with that also. It's like someone has sabotaged. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. But is that opening? Because I see even that is having a problem to open. Friends in a three-year-old child. Smooth K wire. Smooth. But, uh, the K wires won't give the adequate stability. Therefore, there it has to be supplemented with a spica, and it is very easy to apply spica in a three-year-old. That's the reason. You know, beyond the age of uh, eight, ten, even application of spica and uh, management of the spica becomes extremely difficult. That's why at that age you should aim for an absolutely stable, rigid fixation. And what's the indication for a osteotomy? In or asking grade three. A primary, primary osteotomy, a primary, primary valgus osteotomy. osteotomy. Yes, that's also been described in literature, and it's not got many takers for that, sir. Um, it's if you really have a very vertical Powell's uh, fracture line, you may think of doing a primary valgus osteotomy at the time of the surgery itself. But I don't think many people prefer to do that. I think we keep that as an option when we actually land up with problems, a delayed union or a non-union. Then we keep the valgus osteotomy as, which is really the workhorse for management of these two complications. Are the cases opening or are we having a problem with that also? There is a problem in a child. The trans cervical fracture as you are facing the problem with the... Sure, I agree. <laughs> That's a shame. <clears throat> I think uh, that's a good idea. I think if we don't have the cases coming up, we can just have a panel discussion so that, you know, we don't waste too much of time. So what we could do is questions like what Dr. Mukhi is asking. So the role of capsular decompression. Uh, Avi, what do you feel about it? Uh, the, it's quite important to do the capsular decompression if the patient has come quite early because it can reduce even the tamponade effect which can happen. So hopefully we are trying to save ourselves from AVN if possible. 
Uh, Sandeep, anything to add to that? Do you do a capsule decompression routinely? The mic's not on. Hello, yeah. So to answer the issue of avascular necrosis and tamponade, you have literature from Moon as well as from Boyd Z. And they have shown whether you do decompression or you don't decompression, the AVN rates are not much different. So there is no mandatory requirement to do a decompression. But rather than an act of omission, while you are there, you can just slide in a periosteum and decompress for whatever it is worth. But literature does not support that decompression means 100% no AVN. The more important determinants of AVN are accuracy of reduction and stability of fixation. So if, if you ask how you do a, so if you're doing an open reduction, obviously you're doing a capsulotomy at that time. If you're doing a closed reduction, there are two ways as Sandeep showed. One is to do an aspiration with a thick bone needle. Or there's another technique as he showed you, which probably so you missed, where you slide a 11 number blade along the neck of the femur and that itself results in a capsulotomy. You can check this on the AP and lateral views of the C-arm. See that the blade is in contact with the bone all the time and as you slide it up to the center of the neck, you get a gush of blood coming out. So in the absence of evidence does not mean that there is lack of evidence. It just means that uh, we don't have enough numbers to prove or disprove one side of the coin. It adds such little time to the procedure that I think we must do a capsulotomy in all cases. There's nothing lost in doing that. There's, I don't think there's any disadvantage. So in capsule, this capsular decompression, we talk only in children. We never talk in adult. How it is different? What is pathophysiology behind that? So the risk of AVN is much higher in children as compared to adults. That was part of a bit of my talk as well, which if you look at the complications that are different from children versus adults. In children, there is a role that the capsular tamponade, as it is, the, the blood supply is tenuous in children. Once you cross adolescence and you have the physis, which is no longer present, there is a blood supply going from the metaphysis to the epiphysis in an adult. So therefore, you'll find that the risk of AVN is much more in children. The risk of non-union is in fact less in children than in adults. So that's the difference between children's and adults' pathology. So because of the precarious blood supply in children, especially between the ages of 4 to 10, that is when you want to do everything possible to decrease the incidence of avascular necrosis. And we know, as Sandeep rightly pointed out, the main causes are at the time of the injury itself. The amount of fracture displacement which disrupts the blood supply. But there's also a concept that the tamponade can cause a problem with increasing the intracapsular pressure. And therefore, in almost all cases, I think we recommend that we do a capsular decompression. It's a simple, easy procedure, adds another five minutes to your technique. As Avi correctly pointed out, the major blood supply to the pediatric femoral head is through the retinacular vessels. And so it makes sense that if there is an increased pressure, these vessels are likely to get compressed. Whereas in adults, you know, you have vessels going through the metaphysis as well, which wouldn't be susceptible to compression by, uh, you know, intraarticular amponate. Excellent. So we've got the cases coming up and running. So let's begin with our first presenter, Viraj. Why don't you come up? Question. Yeah. So uh, thanks to Sandeep and organizers of the Vairog for uh, giving me opportunity over here. So this is a four-year uh, male child, had a history of fall from height and then injury to the left hip joint and then uh, he presented a little late and by that time when he has presented, the orthopod, uh, he did the x-ray and this was a presentation. So if you see, it's a type 1, that is a transphysial uh, injury where there is a fracture neck femur and it is a three weeks presentation. So. What were the options when he was uh, he was referred to me? The options were either I can give, just give a spica and forget about it. Since three weeks old, still the thought is that still we can reduce it and just give the spica or fix it or just put this uh, in situ screw fixation. We have a slido poll. If not, we can just do a show of hands. So let's have some audience participation. So how many for spica in situ? Just a quick show of hands. Okay, no one. Reduction and spica. Anyone? Okay, so a few hands coming up. Reduction and fixation. Okay, a lot more hands. That's excellent. And a screw in situ. Anyone? No one. So I think we've got to answer. Yeah. Not better to go ahead. Yeah. So then we reduce it gently because then, because since it's a type 1 injury, 
I was really concerned about the uh, avian again because literature says the chances of avian are as high as 90% or more than 90%, right? So reduction and this was a fixation which was done, and this is a five-year follow-up. So the question which was raised by one of the delegate that uh, what happens? So this is there is no avian actually, but there is definitely a coxa magna. This child is really doing well on uh, further follow-up. But uh, nobody knows why there is a coxa magna because of why there is a growth stimulation and there is a coxa magna. But this can happen. So the point is that uh, in type one injury also, it is not like that every case is going to have the avian, right? But there is definitely high incidence of avian. So you have to counsel the parent accordingly. So you, our counseling has to be very very perfect and accordingly consent has to be taken, right? Any question, Dr. Viraj? Can I can I just ask? Yeah. Uh, so this is a type one injury. So, how is a physis of the femoral neck different than, say, probably a lower end radius, where a type one injury, which is of three weeks duration, I will leave it alone. While here, you are going to attempt to reduce and fix, because even reducing a three week old physal injury is going to cause some issues. Yes. Why not just leave it and allow it to remodel and then deal with the repercussions later on? Yeah, I mean, Mandar, you are right in terms, but if you see the literature, the remodeling potential of the distal radius is much much. Higher as compared to the neck of the femur. Even if you do the best of the best uh, acute reduction at a fresh injuries, and still the, the they land up with the varus or maybe some other kind of things. So I think it's a remodeling potential of the area of the bone which is involved. So uh, if in neck femur particularly, if it is possible, one should try and go for the reduction. Oh, thanks, Viraj. I think most of us would have also chosen smooth pins rather than a screw. Uh, it's great that you got away with it, that you didn't cause much physal damage. Probably you removed the screws early enough, as Dr. Mukhi was mentioning. But I think this is a case where most of us would have gone ahead and done smooth pin fixation rather than a screw. Yes, and let's move on to our next uh, presenter. I think the coxa magna is also a manifestation of avian. Correct. And uh, yeah. Sandeep, can you go ahead with uh, presentation is next? It's just like you know, uh, the, like in Perthes, you can get an uh, you know coxa magna. Similarly, in you know very low age uh, avian also, you can land up with uh, coxa magna. Okay, so our next presenter is Avi and he has a case of uh, delayed presenting fractured neck fever. So, so this was a four-year-old uh, girl who fell off the bullock cart in her village and this was the peak time of COVID. So she just sought some local help. No primary treatment was taken and she presented to me eight months post her injury walking like this with a limp and with an outdoor type of appearance. So this is her clinical examination, there is shortening of the limb, there is restriction in uh, rotation, in uh, external rotation as compared to the uh, opposite side. And these are her x-rays. Uh, just a quick uh, to the panel and uh, Dr. Alirek and Sandeep, what do, would you think after looking at this? This is uh, 8 months post her injury. Yeah, so to me, this is a frank non-union because I think once you say it's eight months down the line, this is a frank non-union. It needs to be addressed. So there are also changes of some avascular necrosis probably. Sometimes the avascularity is not just in the head of the femur but also the neck. You can also have a narrowing of the neck down. And that also becomes an issue that we need to deal with. So there's uh, all the elements of non-union. You can see coxavara, you can see narrowing of the neck. And this obviously needs to be dealt yeah, with. Excellently pointed out. So there are changes in the neck. There is sclerosis. Uh, there may be some signs of union that is seen, but this is uh, treated as a non-union. And there is also quite marked retroversion of the head. So this was the uh, MRI scan, which was of the child, which shows almost most of the features which are uh, very pointed. Uh, there is uh, some changes in the head, uh, but not as much. Uh, so, these are the options again, again if uh, raise of hands, what would anyone do? Either leave it alone, uh, anyone for leaving it alone, uh, yes, uh, fixing just in situ from the crowd, uh, then close reduction and fixation, would anyone attempt just a close reduction and fixation, anyone for open reduction and bone grafting, so few hands for open reduction and bone grafting and few for just doing a valgus osteotomy. So, yeah, so few similar hands for open reduction and bone grafting and uh, valgus osteotomy. So, uh, this is, uh, oh, sorry. So, this is what uh, I did. I was not sure if open reduction really would really change because of the way things are. So, I just went for a valgus osteotomy. The child is young. So, went for a pure uh, valgus uh, osteotomy with a external fix, uh, with a, with a plate. And this is her at the follow-up at seven weeks. 
you can see uh, some amount of healing callus is seen nothing much at the neck yet but we corrected the rotation as well as got her leg length back and this is her at six months follow-up you can see uh, the osteotomy has uh, completely healed even the neck which was narrow quite initially now has started to broaden so here uh, this is her at six months i do have a longer but i could not add the, this thing so uh, the lessons learned is fracture neck femur is a fracture of necessity we really need to fix it even with delayed presentations they either uh, do not unite or malunite with they can have coxavara deformity and a valgus osteotomy is a very effective procedure to treat these uh, delayed presentations thank you so much thank you avi now i would invite dr sandeep patwardhan to come on the dais and uh, present his case Okay, so let's move on to non-unions. So this was an adolescent 12-year-old boy who had a road accident. This is a case which Taral and I operated in Ganga Hospital about 10 years ago. So this was a type 2 fracture which was treated earlier by a bone setter and came with an established gap non-union. So the options again, fixation in situ, a valgus osteotomy with fixation, open reduction bone graft valgus osteotomy with fixation or closed or no reduction, in situ stabilization, fibula graft, valgus osteotomy and fixation. How many for A? One. B? Again, no one. C? Okay, open reduction, a few hands and D? In situ stabilization, fibula grafting. Okay. So, um, Dr. Mukhi and Chasnal, as they have raised their hands for this method, what we did was we put a screw to stabilize the non-union in C2. Then we made a small guide wire and used a DHS reamer and passed a fibula graft. And then we did a subtrochantric, intertrochantric valgus osteotomy. And here actually there was a deficient medial neck. So we medialized the shaft and this was the position. At a follow-up, this was at three months. And this was at six months. A uh, couple of things to point out, the osteotomy heals very well. The non-union heals very well. The child has restored limb lengths, good range of motion and good stability. But there are some changes of avascular necrosis. This is at three years. And uh, Dr. Venkat tells me that the child is doing well, but he had some impingement and they had done an osteoplasty and he continues to function quite well. So, in fracture neck femur, which has an established non-union, reconstruction works if we can achieve good bony calcar contact and a fibula graft, especially when the neck is resorbed, is a wonderful way of doing it. But you always need to change the biomechanics by converting it into a valgus osteotomy. A stable implant is also must and you must avoid opening and dissecting too much because whatever little vascularity is available to you, you shouldn't damage it further. Thank you. Thanks, Sandeep. So, just a quick question. You know, in acute fractures, yeah. we recommend that if there is a, a closed reduction fails, you should not hesitate to go ahead with open, open reduction. So, what all, changes in a yeah. review? So, what happens in a non-union is that when the duration is long, the body is always trying to revascularize and trying to heal the area. The gap that is available to you if you do a capsular dissection, you are actually stripping it off, trying to bone graft it. And there will be no bone stock there for you to get any kind of anatomic reduction. So it doesn't make any sense to disturb whatever vascularity is there. What we can do is add biology and change biomechanics. That's all. Makes sense. Uh, Viraj, uh, another case of non-union or rather implant failure. So now this time it is a nine-year female child made with a road traffic accident and then had a delbet uh, type 2 fracture. Right. So, presented to one of my colleague and then uh, reduction and cancellous screw fixation was done. Uh, surprisingly, the 4 mm cancellous screws were used, right, for a 9 year quite a hefty girl. And this is at 1 month, you can see at 2 months and then subsequently at 6 month. At 6 month, I think he thought that weight bearing might give some compression. The weight bearing was allowed and then implants started just coming out and, and then rubbing the acetabulum. So, become very painful hip, right? Uh, so, this was a presentation when the baby, uh, the, this girl was referred to me. There's a frank non-union coxavara. Neck was almost absorbed. I was, I mean, having a doubt about even the vascularity of the femoral head because on x-ray it was, and then limb length disturbance, gross shortening, you can see. 
and very painfully because implants were just rubbing the acetabulum. So, as my previous speakers mentioned, uh, Sandeep as well as Avi and uh, Alarik and Sandeep has mentioned. So, the option was to do, go ahead and do the valgus osteotomy. So, we just took out all the implants and then uh, the pediatric DHS was the only implant which was available at that time and put a lot of graft and since there was a lot of osteoporosis I had to uh, give the spica as well and then she went on good union at healing. This was at 6 months, this was at 3 years, this was down the line 10 years. So, reasonably good amount of length of the neck is still there and this is I think follow up at I think uh, this is 10 years. This girl is doing well, she is a medical graduate, now she is a forensic uh, uh, consultant at uh, UK. Uh, we advise her that uh, she might require neck lengthening surgery future but she is doing well, so she, she denied. So, the message over here is for a 9 year girl, for a, a child who is 9 year old and then just putting the uh, cancellous screws, 4 mm cancellous screws. And then not protecting also because she was not protected. The weight bearing, uh, not weight bearing, but the on bed movements were allowed and not given the spike also. So the lesson learned from this case was a stable fixation. That is what we were discussing in the in the first lecture. That stability of the fracture site is very important, and you have to use the adequate or judge what is the I mean implant which are to be required by the child. And if at all if you are doubting about the fixation, there is no harm giving it and going ahead give the hip spica. That is a lesson learned. So, Viraj, you opened up the fracture site in this case. Uh, yeah, I have to open the fracture site and I have to put the graft so that I can get the, some amount of the reasonable amount of the length of the neck also because it was completely collapsed. It was a cancellous graft. It was a cancellous graft from my leg. This is a slightly different approach from what Sandeep Yeah, Fibula, what Sandeep has used. Thanks so much. So, uh, Sandeep, uh, you have published your review article in the JBJS. So, I would just request you to uh, come across and uh, uh, give your... Uh, Recommendations. Yeah. So, thanks. So, we were fortunate to be invited uh, to write about non-Indians in children's fractures and with my uh, collaborators. What we have said is that when you have a non-Union, it's either of two types. We have either delayed presentation in our country because patient comes late or the implant fails as Viraj has shown. You must evaluate what is the cause. Is it inappropriate fixation, bad choice of implant? or the biomechanics, which means the vertical fracture line which caused the and always rule out infection. When you have failure of fixation as your primary cause, the neck resorption is not that much. So, you can do an implant removal, stabilize in situ, add a valgus osteotomy and fix with a stable implant and it should work well. Most literature supports that. Additional bone graft as Viraj did may or may not be done. But in a delayed presentation, we will always get neck resorption, a lot of fibrous tissue, we must rule out whether there is a pathological fracture. Here we need to restore bone stock and that can be achieved by fibula grafting. Add the biomechanical correction by valgus osteotomy and always use a side plate and a stable fixation. So, these are best practices which we have recommended and I recommend that all of you can go and read that paper for more details. Yeah, thanks Sandeep, I think that's a very valuable algorithm because as you have seen a valgus osteotomy is sort of the workhorse for most of the non-unions but deciding when to open the fracture site, whether you need to actually bone graft it with cancellous bone or whether you can use that fibrous tissue itself to change into bone by just putting a, a, a fibula strut across it is valuable lessons which has come from your algorithm. So, thank you so much for that. Thanks. Uh, I think so, we'll have a final last case. case. So, Chintan, what because there was so much discussion on AVN, I would just like to present this case. This is an 11-year-old girl, a delbit 2 fracture which was treated somewhere else in the interiors with a couple of cancellous screws and you can see that the fracture has healed but the screws have migrated proximally and there is avascular necrosis. So, most of us when there is AV and we really don't know what to do next. So, the surgeon what he did was to prevent further erosion of astabulum he removed that screw and kept the child non-weight bearing. At 6 months implants were removed. Some alendronates were started and the child continued to be in an oblique pelvis with an adduction deformity, impinging, pain and uh, difficulty in sitting cross-legged. Typical Indian girl whose requirement was squatting on the floor. So, this is 9 months after rehab and supplementation and alendronates. And at this stage, over the years, we had learnt more about safe surgical dislocation and trying to reshape the head. 
So with a guarded prognosis, I explained to them that this is avian post neck femur. We'll give it a try because the cartilage gap looked good. And I would like to take away that anterolateral bump and do a relative neck lengthening. So for that pain and impingement at one year post-op with this kind of an x-ray, I went ahead and I did a safe surgical dislocation. We could trim away the anterolateral bump nicely. We distalized the greater trochanter. And this was the kind of x-ray that I could give her after the surgery. And in six months time, I was really amazed at the quality of function that she came back with. Initially, she was not so good, but with good rehab and good therapy, she's really regained most of the function that she needed. So the lesson learned was that AVN doesn't mean it's a hopeless case. Give it some time, let it remodel. And what remains, we can reshape it today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sandeep. That was a great case. I think AVN is a very challenging aspect of a fractured neck femur. There are very few solutions to that. Uh, of course, AVN can present in so many different ways. Luckily, here you didn't have a collapse of the entire head and it was not badly deformed. You just had a little bit of impingement from the anterior lateral sector so you could get away with uh, trimming of that and doing a sort of an osteoplasty of the femoral head. But what about if it comes in an early stage? I'd just like to ask the panel, if you see AVN coming in really early and we know that within the first few months, you can start seeing AVN, what is your protocol then? So, uh, my protocol now, after I've done these few cases is that I remove the implant if it is cutting out to prevent further erosion and damage. And through the tract of the screw, I instill a zoolandric acid under pressure with a syringe pump. And it, it, is, it, it binds to the dead part of the head and prevents rapid resorption, preventing osteoclasis. If the cartilage is good, go ahead with active range of motion. I encourage swimming and cycling and prevent them from doing any contact sports. But I give about a year of remodeling and then reassess. And then if there is a reasonable head with at least uniplanar movement and the other planes are blocked because of a physical deformity, I can go ahead and reconstruct it. I think it's very important to catch them pre-collapse. I think the earlier you diagnose it, I think it's important. You keep them on delayed weight bearing. I think that's one role that has uh, something to play. You can do multiple drilling sometimes. You can inject ibandronate or zolendronate, whatever is available. And Abroad, there's even talk of injecting uh, BMP2 to sometimes encourage the new vascularization. Any other deferring thoughts on this? Are we, Chintan? Uh, like, uh, any views on, uh, you know, giving prophylactic oral bisphosphonates to every child after a surgery? Not really oral, but intravenous. So, you can give zolentronate. That has been shown to work as well. So, catching them early pre-collapse is important. So, I think it's once you see early AVN to really diagnose it in time and treat it well with all of these things. So, delay weight bearing. Start off on intravenous uh, bisphosphonate therapy. You can do drilling. You can uh, inject uh, a bisphosphonate to the head as well. And all of these things may have a role to play. Any other differing opinions? Uh, very, very uh, similar to what uh, Dr. Sandeep also said. So, it's basically we just have to make sure the implant does not penetrate. So, remove the implant. If, if the implant is there, just remove it. So, most of your decompression is done that time. I think intraosseous bisphosphonates plays a quite good role if you catch them early in compared to oral bisphosphonates. Sure. Great. Can I just uh, say a few words? Yeah. So, in pediatric uh, non-union neck femur fracture, there is a very nice sandhu classification where the treatment is based on what is the residual size of the head fragment, how much is the resorption, what is the gap between the fragments and what is the status of, you know, uh, vascularity of the head. Based on that, I think we can make a good decision whether to do a supplement with fibula graft or just do valgus osteotomy or what is your view, Alaric, on that? I think any of these things which help us in the decision-making process is all valuable. There are hosts of classifications, even Avi has shown us when it comes to neck or femur, we just don't use the Delbert classification. I think even looking at uh, the zones of the femoral neck to decide your implant usage as described by Panigrahi, I think is again a valuable uh, aspect to it. So anything that helps in the decision-making process, I think is worthwhile. We just have a minute or so remaining, so I think we'll ask Sandeep to give us the final uh, take-home messages. One question not answered. Yes, sir. Broken K wire, the guide wire which was broken inside, should any attempt be made to remove or not to remove? So I think it all depends on is it intra-articular. Yeah. If it is intra-articular, obviously it has to come out. Yeah. If it isn't, I think that it's your call. You can leave a guide wire and you can leave a broken key wire. I don't think it makes any impact at all. It's going to be probably worse trying to extricate that than just leaving it alone. If it is broken intra-articularly, of course, I think you have no choice but to remove it. Thank you, sir. Second question is, 
what is the role of MRI? Why did it subject a child to MRI? When there is non-union, the chance of MRI is going to complicate the issue. So I don't think any of us said do an MRI. No, they showed in the first case. MRI uh, was, because uh, was, I would like to point out here that the head revascularization, the MRI cannot tell you whether it is there so or not. That's right. So I'd like to go ahead and try to salvage the head. I'd like to point Unless out. Unless it is revascularizing, yeah. you cannot pick up so on I'd the like MRI. to point out, I had not got the MRI done. The child had got it on outside and come with it. Yeah, so I normally do not get routine yeah. MRIs done. Point taken, sir. So I think we are, uh, the time is drawing to a close. So what are the take home messages we take uh, from this session? So fracture neck femur is a fracture of necessity. It must always be fixed. Except in the very young child, stable fixation gets precedence over physis preservation. Anatomical reduction is mandatory. And if that is not possible with closed means, open the fracture site if needed. Use side plate for more distal basic cervical fractures in order to achieve a stable fixation. Intracapsular hematoma drainage has a controversial role, but it may help in reducing the rates of AVN. And finally, valgus osteotomy, fibula graft are techniques which may be employed in complex situations like non-union pathological fractures. Thanks a lot. Sir, I have a question. I think we have run out of time. We can discuss, we can discuss over lunch or over the tea break. Yeah? Thank you so much. Thanks, Sandeep, for being an excellent co-convener for this session. And thank you all of you for being a very patient audience.